So this is the beginning of our chat, Evan, but this is actually round two of our chat today because I forgot to hit record when we were doing the meetup. And so now I drug you back into a Zoom room right. and... You know what they say, fail, fail forward, don't fail back. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it will be a bit more polished on my end and on yours. Now we are giving sure. people this magic that we created live a little while ago. We're going to try and do that again. So first, let's just start off with who you are, what you're doing. I'll tell people right now, you are the CEO of Maya Data and you have quite a history in storage. So I'd love to hear from you where you came from, what you're doing now. Great, sure. So, um, some years ago, I was uh, I got to know a, a team that was actually doing open source uh, Linux and Solaris based stuff, uh, operating systems, and we found the the first big user was Stanford University using it, uh, particular uh, comp sci physics, uh, some, um, one or two other departments using it, primarily as an open, better, faster, cheaper. NetApp was a flyware, and, and, and so we uh, conceptualized and created what became Nexenta, which became the, the most widely deployed open source based, not 100% open source, but open source based storage. And so that got to thousands of customers and a uh, hundred, you know, a few hundred million dollars in uh, run rate business through partners. Uh, and then I, I left, and then I helped start another company called Stackstorm, which is now a project in the CNC, not in the CNCF, in the Linux Foundation. Also, oh, nice. in this case, 100% open source. And then I was introduced, uh, just to bring us up to date, I was introduced to Uma and Kieran, who had been doing containerized storage, the subject of our chat today. They had been doing it, though, in a proprietary way, actually on BSD jails, not even on uh, sort of Linux containers or Docker. And they saw that it's great, they have some customers and so forth, but the future was open source and open source storage. So they got in touch with me, we really hit it off and we thought, hey, let's take that team and, and technical heritage and apply it. This is before Kubernetes, by the way, which is, kind of bonkers to think there is there was a time before <laughs> Kubernetes, but this is before Kubernetes, and uh, and decided to spin up what then became Open EBS and, and 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 took us forward to this day. So this is probably three and a half, four years, four years ago now that that we met, and open source, uh, sorry, Open EBS to give you an idea is about three and a half years old, mm -hmm. and I got fully involved uh, a few years ago. So here we are. And as you mentioned, the topic of conversation that we wanted to touch on today was this idea of container attached storage. Can you just break that down for us real fast? Because I know there's some people that may know what it is, but it could be a bit of a buzzword as we talked about. There's a, or some people will just say, oh, that's marketing, right? Right. So what is it? It's actually intended to sort of be an antidote to a buzzword. And the buzzword is cloud native storage. Because cloud native storage immediately means all things to all people, which means it means nothing. And so what we thought is let's define something that actually refers to a particular pattern. The particular pattern is you have workloads and under each workload, you have a disaggregated storage controller. And, and you, in fact, you might want to just have pass through, we can talk about the different modes at which this is deployed, but it's the notion uh, that in order to do this pattern, Kubernetes is not just something you want to serve. Hey, let's connect to it via CSI and now claim we're cloud native. No, no. What we're saying is let's use Kubernetes as the platform upon which we will build data management and storage for you. And uh, so it's those couple of things. There's a blog that came out uh, today, as you know, on the CNCF's Cloud Native Computing Foundation site that tries to further define it. And that's what we've tried to do is in an open way, and let's have conversations and debate it, but we try to write it down. This is what we think it is. What do, what do other people think? But it's now 
extremely popular. O Open EBS, when the Cloud Native Computing Foundation asked, hey, of all of these cloud native storage projects, and then they asked about all sorts of things that are not cloud native storage projects, like just Amazon. But anyway, of all of these, which ones are being used in production? Which ones are being trialed? And Open EBS was the one that is most trialed. So it's by far the most popular container attached storage, or let's say open source containerized, um, yeah, cloud native storage, if you want to use that term, which again, I think is a little amorphous to people. Well, I love how ruthlessly honest you are in your <laughs> ways of explaining things. And Good. I want to talk a bit, I mean, it's top of mind right now, right? Last week, we just saw what happened with Portworks and they could fall into this category. And we'll oh, get yeah. to that in a minute, but following this CNCF blog post that you just put out, I think there are some really key points that you make in there that I just wanted you to elaborate on. One of which is what I've heard you talk about quite a bit, and it is the idea of loosely coupled teams or tightly coupled teams, right? And can you explain to us what you're talking about there? Sure. So again, my, my brain has been soaked in, you know, environments like uh, the folks that we served at Stackstorm, like, uh, like Netflix and uh, others of their ilk. And what I saw there firsthand or secondhand, depending how you look at it, uh, was that this loose coupling, which is actually in the definition of cloud native, that the CNCF has on their GitHub and so forth. This loose coupling applies as much to teams as it does to technologies. So yes, OpenEBS, under unlike a shared storage system, has a bunch of loosely coupled components. That's great. But maybe what's most important is it enables you, your teams, to remain loosely coupled. And so the two pizza team that you hear about that communicates via APIs, not via interminable meetings, that's what we're enabling. And conversely, if you just say CSI, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, one API to rule them all, how hard can it be? We just pipe everything down into the shared storage system. Great. But that is a recipe, A, for um, discussions. Let's call them discussions <laughs> about how do we want that uh, shared storage system configured. That is a recipe for you have all these loosely coupled pieces so that you have resilience, right? If my uh, microservice just craps out, you shouldn't be tightly coupled to me, right? That's the architecture, that's super. But if you then, all literally all of your data goes into one shared storage system and it craps out, you're out, you're out, out. Everything's out, all the resilience you've built in, all of the you know service mesh stuff, is, it doesn't matter. You have a hard outage, your blast radius is enormous. So there's a variety of things around loose coupling. Uh, it's loose coupling enables agility, buzzword bingo, but it enables these small teams to move fast without relying on each other. It also uh, enables a level of resilience that uh, still maybe to this day, DevOps type architectures just don't get enough credit for, but they should. Because if you run something like an open EBS on top of a shared storage, you have belt and suspenders. Your pants are not gonna fall down here, right? Uh, you have the resilience up at our layer, and then if you also want data uh, resilience at that layer, you have both. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an important concept. Well, I think it's really interesting how you talk about this idea of you're evading, or you're, you're not evading, but you're just taking out of the mix discussions. Like that whole thing around, okay, we're, we could have a discussion around this or a full-on argument, right? You're just going to take out that whole piece of the puzzle because it's not in it anymore. So I find that really interesting and it goes along. It's more of a, it doesn't even have to do with tech really, right? Like it's more of a cultural thing. And right. that's, I, I find that brilliant. So uh, I just quickly on that quick, someone, uh, funny anecdote, I think, is I remember chatting with Adrian Cockroft when he was at Netflix, right? And uh, he's, uh, he's somebody who always has a great turn of phrase available, by the way. He's a, uh, a brilliant guy. But um, and I asked him, like, Adrian, how do you do it? Like, I'm walking around Netflix. There doesn't seem to be a hierarchy per se here, as far as I can tell. We all know that about the culture there. 
Hmm. You're chief architect. How do you get them all to do what you think the right architecture is? How's that? And he said, no, no, I just imagine what I think the correct architecture is. I say that's what we're doing. And eventually people align in that direction if I'm right. <laughs> uh -huh. So it's, it's loose coupling, yeah, absolutely, uh, to the people and uh, enable, enabling the small team to do what they want. And OpenEBS does enable that. This whole pattern does. Yeah, it's enabling that freedom. So yes. the other point that I think is very interesting in the blog post that you wrote about is, I think, what did you put? It was like cloud native or cloud isn't cloud native. And can you talk right. a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, and sometimes people talk about this a little bit as the buzzword bingo or meme bingo, uh, you know, the distributed monolith. So, uh, but basically if the pattern is, in, you know, you've taken out this Oracle database system or this time in, in writing stuff, you're not relying on everything to pipe down into just one central database to rule them all. You're not going to do that. You're going to have all these microservices. That's cool. And then you pipe them all down to one cloud or one RDMS, um, you know, Aurora or database as a service. That you, you now have replicated the old pattern, right? Except you've done it with a higher tax, arguably. You should have just built an end tier application, just gone full monolith at that point, right? What are you doing? Because you're going to have arguments over how you configure that database as a service, it, it doesn't come like with a DBA included, right? You gotta be your own DBAs. The DBAs are gonna pop the hood on it and say, I don't like the data model. I don't like the way this thing was constructed. And you're gonna argue about it unless they each have their own. Now, if they each have their own, now you're getting to a container attached pattern, right? So that's what I was reacting to. It was actually a great point made by, I believe, a NetApp engineer in this kind of discussion around KubeCon, like, hey, you're kind of saying that if I use one Aurora or one uh, Redshift, one database to rule them all in my architecture, somehow the cloud service isn't cloud native. And that's, that's correct. It, it isn't. If you're using it in that way, it's not cloud native. If you're not going disaggregated, uh, then, then you're not, you don't really have a cloud native architecture. Yeah. And it makes sense. You want to be free of vendor lock-in on every level, right? And you want to be free of these potential uh, minefields that could blow up in your face. So yeah. now let's talk a bit about what you feel are the new requirements for CAS or this um, container attached storage. Right. I would just say we're reflecting what we're seeing in terms of users. Um, and uh, so we're trying to reflect back to the community and say, hey, this is what we're hearing. Is this what what you're trying to say in your usage out here. And so for sure, open source, let's start with that one since you just mentioned it, that seems to be more and more important to folks. And certainly today, given the news last week, literally um, just a second ago, between our webinars, <laughs> I was looking on Slack because there's a whole, there's all these scripts and all this, you know, people are actively migrating off their proprietary CAS onto open source CAS. Our approach, is you shouldn't have been on proprietary in the first place. I mean, Kubernetes is open source. So some of the freedom and agility it gives you is freedom from lock-in, freedom from some of these dependencies uh, at the business level and the architectural level. And so if it's not open source, then you are building in a dependency to a vendor into your, into your business and just be aware of that. But the other things that we said are we think the microservices architecture, right, that Kubernetes enables, that should be embraced also by container attached storage. We certainly do. Because we're seeing users who, like uh, Datastax, Cassandra users, the storage they want is they don't want typical storage at all. They want pass through mode down to the disk, right? So that's one extreme. That's a particular uh, engine for us. Other users, what they want is NVMe super high performance storage, right? Could be the same user, uh, but not always. Sometimes you have disk. Other users, what they want is just let it run on ARM. Give me literally like no footprint, tiny storage user space. And it's basically impossible to do that with a monolith. And that's why 
our, we didn't take a monolithic approach. It wasn't because we wanted to take longer and code more stuff, right? But that's what we've had to do vis-a-vis -vis someone like a Portworks, who has a more of a traditional monolithic architecture that they got to market sooner. They're also an older company, right? They've been around longer. But it, it, um, it's at the cost of user choice. They have fewer parameters. So we think container-attached storage, the pattern being you run on Kubernetes, you ought to leverage Kubernetes. You shouldn't be a monolith. You should have microservices that, that uh, work on a per workload basis appropriate uh, for that workload or small group. Those are two open source. And, and, you know, yeah, the performance one we can get into, but that's a, a real emerging one as well. Mm -hmm. So there was a bit of, I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, but I did some okay. question asking to some people in your network. I reached out to people and I said, what do you want to ask Evan in light of the most recent events that happened and just in general? And so I, I wrote Chris and asked him what he would like to hear. And he said, in light of the Portworx acquisition, I'd be interested to understand Maya Data's business model a bit more. Can open source storage provision for Kubernetes orchestrated containers survive against mainstream players like Pure, VMware, NetApp, and Astra? Right. Yeah, um, Astra being this r rumored and, and announced uh, project from NetApp. Um, and, you know, Chris is uh, an incisive uh, journalist, truly a journalist, or works obviously at the Register, Chris Meller, uh, we're talking about. Uh, but the premise of the question is totally wrong. Like, they're not mainstream. They're totally out of the stream. I mean, when we're talking to Kubernetes SREs, it's not like they're saying, I know how I'm going to architect my system. There's this company called NetApp. NetApp? No, there's this last company of pure storage? I think I've heard of that. Those are the people that take my CIO out to golf or whatever. But they, they are not building this into their stack. They just know this is not cloud native. Oh, you know, this is top of mind stuff. Not at all. And so uh, you want to be in the stream. The mainstream is being part of the, you know, the cloud native community ecosystem, being the easiest way to deploy all the way, let's shift left, right? Uh, to developers when they're developing this in their dev environment, that's where open EBS fits. That's one reason it's architected in it. It's 100% you know, user space, runs on every, every Kubernetes the same way, because we've got to enable self-adoption to happen in minutes. Imagine turning up, your, hey, uh, maybe we should try this new NetApp array. How long does that take, right? It's, it's literally a six month, it, okay. Technically you can plug it in, but in an environment, it, it, it's quarter. It's maybe you know quarter, maybe six months, depending to, to the point you're, as opposed to five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So we're in the stream. These folks uh, are wonderful companies that have earned their you know, respect. Uh, by building their own distributed systems, basically, uh, pre-Kubernetes distributed systems, but they're not in the mainstream of Kubernetes adoption. So, so our business model is, you know, consistent with all the other open source based uh, infrastructure, uh, unicorns, not the word unicorn, but uh, successful software companies out there, uh, like the Confluent Kafka folks, like MongoDB, or um, and you just go down data stacks, data bricks, et cetera. All, all of these folks are based on open source and open source is a pretty hard requirement now for the modern enterprise. And it's true, when you get down to the data layer, you know, it's right there, like open EBS, port works, that's right there. The layer below, there's a lot of, there is Ceph, which is open source, right? There's a lot of proprietary. Uh, but in, in general, the stack right where we're at and above in infrastructure and around, it's all open source. Hmm. I mean, so, I, who's using, I don't know, Tivoli or whatever, I don't know, no, Tibco, sorry. No, they're using Kafka, right? There's no, there's no proprietary message queues being used up there, as far as I know uh, at this time. So this is now we're getting into bonus round territory because... I didn't get to ask you a few things Great. when we were in the actual meetup. And okay. in a second, I'll splice to us going into the meetup. 
But what I wanted to ask you on this bonus round, we could say, is how do you stand as far as operators go? Right. Um, Operators make me, this is one reason I'm so supportive of the data or try to be supportive and love the, the idea of the data on Kubernetes community because I think walking through, helping people to have a space in which they can walk through operating patterns, including operators, CRDs, extensions of Kubernetes, you know, mix, mixing cloud services versus all of those things, we need more discussion of what's working and what isn't working. Uh, we have some large users who talk about, you know, the anecdote is, yeah, I see the operators. And, you know, this one big user is running, I want to say 11 flavors of databases in production, each of which they said have, you know, five to 20 different operators out there. So how am I, so I'm already like dealing with different databases that I, as a platform team, helping my developers really run in production. And now people say, hey, choose from the operators, it'll help you. Yeah, but which of the, whatever that work, the map works out to, you know, which of the hundred do I use? How do I life cycle an operator and so forth? Red Hat's put a lot of thinking into that. Uh, obviously, um, uh, uh, Kudo Project and others seem really well thought out as well. And we, we contribute to a, to a project that we use quite a bit called, it used to be called the Meta Controller Project. Um, but, um, but a lot of it is a little up in the air right, right now, I would, mm. I would say. And, you know, to some extent, it's an opportunity for folks like us who basically say, full stop, your Kubernetes SRE running data on Kubernetes, we will do whatever it takes with one of the top contributors to CNCF projects overall, like we're fifth now, we will do whatever it freaking takes to make you successful. And that includes, oh, uh, yeah, that operator, great, but we're seeing people use this operator for databases, or whatever. You know, we help people on that all the time. But there is a lot of, I might be wrong, maybe patterns are emerging. This is something, you know, we're starting to hear on this community, but it seems like there's a lot of confusion still to me. Hmm. All right, last question in the bonus round. Yep. Uh, I want to know, for cloud-native workloads, should I choose... HCI or disaggregated architecture? Oh, great. Um, yes, you should. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, so OpenEBS, you know, supports either. Um, so network, so one reason that you want locality is autonomy for these small teams, but one re- a, a primary reason is network, right? So if you're actually, obviously, you know, running the workload where the uh, data is, you're not, you shouldn't be hopping over an external network. You may still run into intra-cluster networking questions, uh, which we can help you with, or the community can help you with, uh, but it should be faster. So you have more control, it should be faster. This whole question, though, of network latency may be getting to be less germane, at least in the NVMe space. Uh, where we're an active player and have brought to Kubernetes an extremely fast Rust-based engine, like extra, you know, almost theoretical max speed, yet to be fully proven. You know, it's in a whole bunch of big environments now, and, and there'd be more reports. Why? Because NVMe actually says ye shall not. It's deterministic, and ye shall not have more than it's in the microsecond range. It's like a very low amount of latency anywhere in the data center. At that point, do you really care if it's HCI or not? You probably don't care. Um, so that's just something to consider, that those constraints are being loosened. We also see something similar happening at you know orders of magnitude slower, so there will be more latency because of speed of light with these uh, cloud providers. As you start to have, and you have in the, some of their backbones, low latency across around the world, lower latency, different that you could also maybe maybe there's a world in which it's somewhat less important um, or at least if you pre-populate the data in a way that uh, we and others enable you to you can do dr you know on the, on the fly much better but it's a great question we see a lot of hci uh, with the rise of high performance media people are building more storage only uh, pods and, and um and that may morph again with cloud services we will see 
Perfect. Well, let's jump into the meetup right now and we will talk more. I know that you have like a North Star of what exactly you want the users to be. And you, you spoke about it a bit, like the people that are using open EBS are people that need to get in there and they need to be changing code or they, they can't wait around because it's mission critical, as you said. So when you build this product, how do you focus on that person and who is that person? Yeah, that's almost the, the, that should have been my answer in a sense, right? Because that's our North star is, the Kubernetes SRE and or, and, and you could look at what that means. It's often just the person in the small team who is at, tasked with dealing with the Kubernetes and data bits, right? And then there's somebody who's a, a layer up, they're dealing with the message. They, if they use Kafka and that service and somebody else is if there's any GUI elements, right? So it's a, it's a person in a team who is responsible for dealing with the, the Kubernetes bits, let's say. And that, person can grab open EBS uh, as a part of grabbing again literally Kafka and, and and Cassandra and running them locally in their dev environment it's the easiest thing right uh, to grab it's 100% user space it's open source so our North Star is make or help make the Kubernetes SREs successful in using Kubernetes for data and that is a shift left so just, I got to get back to buzzwords. So that helps the whole model shift left versus folks like traditional storage where they're selling directly into the VP of whatever platform, right? And that's fine. Don't get me wrong that uh, to have six and seven figure type engagements, very large customers, we need to talk to them. They're not swiping a credit card to that level, but when we, we were just chatting this morning uh, with, a, with a user and uh, they're like, yeah, we asked around, there are a bunch of open EBS users already here, right? So that, that's the model and uh, that's the persona. And that's where litmus comes from, by the way. Sometimes we get asked to walk me through this. You have you know, data layer with some backup, other things in Kubera, visualization, control, compliance, that's great. What is this litmus thing? Well, Litmus fits right in because we get asked this all the time. Can I really trust Kubernetes as my data layer, right? And implicitly and explicitly, we're saying, heck yeah, you can, right? Look at these, look at the Bloombergs, look at, look at the Opteros. They're doing it. Some folks that have been on your, uh, on your um, meetup. So they, they're doing it. You can do it. But if you also look at Bloomberg, they actually wrote a chaos engineering project, right? Um, his name, I can't remember. It's like powerful seal or something, which is now integrated into Litmus. So we also saw from the early adopters, this pattern of wanting to be able to a stress test, if you will, stress test is not quite right, but do chaos engineering around use of, of, uh, of Kubernetes as your data layer. And so we thought, why not? Well, we needed it ourselves for self-defense to make sure that our users were we're deploying in a way that was safe and managing in a way that was safe. So why not turn it into open source project? And, and uh, hence Litmus was born and now it's kind of taken on a life of its own with Intuit and uh, others contributing heavily to it. And it, it is one of the leading chaos engineering projects, but its roots come from this notion of focus on the Kubernetes SRE, do whatever it freaking takes to help them succeed at running data on Kubernetes. That's great to hear. So, I see there's a question in the chat. I'll get to that in a second. Yep. I just want to ask, what are some of the best learnings you brought from Open Solaris and ZFS to oh. Open EBS? Right. Um, yes. Uh, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, first off, versus Nexenta, we're we're 100. We're 100% uh, open source. I mean, Kubera, you know, as a SaaS offering, isn't 100% open source, but all of the components are open source, and we're actually are open sourcing uh, the GUI components as well. And some of that is already hit on the Litmus side. So that may not be per se due to stuff we've learned from Nexenta, but it is a difference. Um, so the HA capabilities of, of 
Solaris at that time, the, the best ones were proprietary. And uh, we had to use a particular proprietary one, which kept us less than 100% open source. So that, that was uh, just one thing that we could do better. I think the bigger one is you need a benevolent dictator in this space. I don't mean within OpenEBS. I mean, you know, VMware, whom I respect uh, mightily, and I appreciate the way that they're embracing actually aspects of container attached storage and their patterns. They weren't exactly the most benevolent of dictators when we were all building uh, software defined storage, right? The game there was uh, pay them a lot for every protocol to validate that you could actually work with uh, VMware. And uh, I can, I have etched into my brain the name of all these APIs you had to support and all of this, and uh, the amount of money we were paying them just to say that we worked with vSphere. So what, who's the benevolent dictator here? Uh, it's the CNCF and Kubernetes itself. So now open APIs, man, and you can extend it, custom resources, CRDs, it is a radical uh, improvement. And it can, it's defensible, right? Because uh, of the way that it was open sourced and the way that, I mean, at the end of the day, it's Google, it's Red Hat, it's the four companies. There's only four companies ahead of us in, in the rank ordering of contributors to CNCF projects overall, but they've contributed some of the world's best distributed systems engineering here, for sure. So Kubernetes is the big difference. Kubernetes and the fact that it's governed in a pretty open way is a massive, massive difference. Um, you can then get into the technology, okay, containers versus VMs, and uh, I think all that's true. I think if all of this hadn't happened and you still had NVMe coming, you'd still be disrupting the shit out of the storage industry. I think that and the rise of NoSQL and its desire to get straight to the disk would be changing architectures anyway. You wouldn't, look, the end for shared storage was nigh anyway, right? It was already happening because you already had workloads saying, get the, get out of my way. I want to get to the million IOPS on that system, all your metadata lookups, you just get in the freaking way, expand the blast radius. So we would have seen the storage industry turned over anyway. I don't think people fully grok that, but Kubernetes, benevolent dictator there, and some ability to deliver enterprise class capabilities on Kubernetes without having to resort to proprietary, you know, HA and so forth are the big changes. Well, can you talk a little about this? What you told me, I think, uh, when we spoke last was these legacy vendors and how they're starting to embrace Kubernetes. Cause as you say, VMware is now it's doing stuff and I, I know it's not public per se, but you've, you've heard some rumors and you've heard some whispers and I'd love for you to tell us about that. Sure. I mean, if you pop the hood on what a traditional enterprise storage array, for example, is, what are you going to find? You're going to find some repository database, key value store, whatever that keeps track of where can I store my data? What else? You're going to, you're going to find retry logic, like a control loop. Uh, you're going to find basically a distributed system. What is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a platform for building distributed systems. That's actually what it is. Uh, at least if you talk to, depending on when you hear him talk, Joe Beta or people like this who helped invent Kubernetes in the first place. So this fact is not lost on a lot of the big storage vendors, uh, some of whom are, are grabbing, uh, have told us they're grabbing maybe open EBS or components of open EBS itself as they refactor their own storage systems, right? Uh, so uh, for metadata, where can you store the data? Um, you know, Seth has some, uh, you can figure it out via crush maps and all this kind of stuff. It's open source, but it's orthogonal to Kubernetes. What open EBS does is it uses uh, custom resources and it basically extends at CD. That CD is a pretty kick-ass key value store, right? It's the heart of Kubernetes. Why not use that to keep track of where can we store data? Where have we stored data? 
where do we not want to store data anymore because the disks are failing or whatever. That's the kind of pattern that we've you know, embraced by building ourselves on top of Kubernetes, but it's also the kind of pattern that we see um, major storage vendors starting to embrace uh, as well. And uh, you know, it's awesome. And uh, it's awesome to see. And we're actually really encouraging them. And uh, I think they, I don't know how much encouragement they need, but hey, I mean, if you see a direction that open EBS should go to help you in your business, come on. I mean, you know, the community's open. Come on in, you know, the water's warm. Contribute to NDM, which is this component, which is the metadata piece that I talked about. Um, whatever you think, contribute to, I mean, Jeffrey, uh, again, our CTO and that team is contributing upstream to a, an engine that, uh, that uh, leverages uh, underlying NVMe. You know, we collaborate with some tier, some very large storage vendors in that space, but they might also like the Rust capabilities that we've written around that NVMe engine. Um, yeah, so so jump in, and specifically with VMware, um, you know, it's a scene as a bit of an existential threat, right? I think there, and so that's like, and they're a world class engineering organization. So, you know, I, I know earlier. Or, in the year, they were hiring 14 or 15 product managers in and around. So yeah, 150 engineers. You know, they're throwing a lot of very smart people at Tanzu, and you see the announcements and the work they're doing. But it shouldn't be lost on any of us that part of the announcement with MinIO and others recently around the Tanzu and vSAN is pass-through mode. What the hell is pass-through mode? Basically, they're saying Datastax is another one uh, who we're friendly with. Basically, what they're saying is, hey, if you want our storage to not do any storage, just tell us. You can use these Kubernetes APIs, and we will get out of the way. Um, and that's pretty cool, right? Um, because it is an aspect of what container attached storage uh, does. So let's field some questions from the chat, shall yes. we? We've got... Harsh Takur saying, I'm not sure if it's a question or just a statement. He's saying, curious about whether OpenEBS will be offered as a cloud service by major cloud providers. That integration would be dope. Uh, uh, yeah, I would say, you know, stay tuned. I mean, there's, um, I don't think Harsh uh, is, I know Harsh, I, I, if it's the same Harsh, um, uh, I don't think he is trying to uh, get me to tip our hand, but there is some news along those lines. But basically, if you think about it, if part of your, so for a cloud provider, the edge is the enterprise, right? The cloud is the core, the edge is the enterprise. What do you need over there? Kubernetes is your data plane. Okay, so you need something that's Kubernetes native. You wanna be able to scale down. So the answer of you know, something like a SEP is, oh, you want resilience, no problem. Give me five additional nodes. And I will, like, no, not five additional nodes. Dude, I have like one node, <laughs> two nodes. So you need something that can scale down. Um, but then we would argue you also need something that can move, that can perform, right? And so if you look at current Open EBS, right, recent releases of Open EBS, like uh, include Maya Store 0.4, it's very fast, right? And so we, we do, there are some design wins that have occurred recently, nothing announced. We will see how those hit the market and to what extent they credit us or you know, fork us or what, what, whatever the case may be. But it looks, it, based on engineer to engineer conversations in and around the community, it looks like, yes, you're gonna see, um, you already see a bunch of telcos as a, in Adopters ND who are using uh, OpenEBS in all sorts of ways. So yeah, it does look like relatively small footprint plus you know, NVMe like super high performance seems to be the recipe within Kubernetes native control plane. So OpenEBS will be used there, whether it's announced as part of a service or not is kind of in flight. Hmm. So let's continue on. We've got yep. another question from Paolo who's asked, he's asking, well, he's, he's saying first, I've been working with Portworx for two years. They have a very smart approach to guarantee hyperconvergence in case of applications who need container storage 
in the node where the pod is going to be launched. It is senior, it is continuing. It's stork. It's stork. Uh, yeah. stork. There we go. It's stork. How does open EBS address? Yes, open EBS has the uh, same uh, in, in this regard. I would say overall compared to Portworks, uh, Port, which is not exactly Paolo's question, but I'll come back to it is, uh, Portworks, um, open EBS as an open source project tends to be is a bit broader, right? And uh, in my data as well, we do uh, a number of things. Um, Portworks has been more enterprise focused, right, given their model, and uh, more polished, and they used to be faster, and that's you know changed over the last uh, several months. Um, that's pretty high level. But when it comes to something like this, can, uh, can you effectively use affinity, anti-affinity, and so forth to pin, to try to pin uh, the data to where the workloads are, and vice versa with OpenEBS, kind of like you can with Stork, so you want to deliver hyperconvergence uh, for certain workloads? The answer is absolutely yes. And and by the way, sometimes at its extreme or whatever you want to say, when you're going down that route, what you want again is so-called pass-through mode, right? Where it's not only do I want is the workload running where the data is, I want the workload running where the data is to get performance. And so as part of that, don't give me any stinking metadata lookups, right? Don't do any of that. Don't take 40% off the speed of my NVMe. Get me straight to the freaking disk. And that is what local PV is. And that, by the way, is why local PV, local persistent volumes in Kubernetes speak, is winning versus shared storage, at least for workloads like, again, data stacks is Cassandra and so forth. And why even VMware had to acknowledge as such and embrace pass-through mode. So sometimes no storage is the storage you want. It's the pass-through and the orchestration that you want. And Open EBS does that as well. So not only can you, yes, do HCI where we're in between, maybe you want three copies, but you really want to, to try to keep the data where the workload is, kind of to Paul's points. But other times, you trust, man, look, I've got a eight-node ring of Cassandra. I, I don't need three copies underneath or five copies. I want zero copies. I want to get to the disk in a Kubernetes native way. I want OpenEBS to manage any pooling that might exist there. And so local PV, I make it sound like one thing. It being OpenEBS and a vibrant open source community, there's like four or five flavors of local PV. So just be aware. But you know, I want just raw block access. We give that to you. I, I, I want a level of pooling with ZFS. We give that to you. The community gives that to you, but we support it commercially for folks like Optero. Uh, and so there's different flavors of that local PV done in a way so it is just, you, you deploy Cassandra, it's dead easy. There's actually a webinar on this with the Datastax folks on Thursday. Not on this only, but on with Datastax. You know, and, and so it's a great question. But yes, HCI is available, but if you will, HCI plus or minus, depending on how you look at it, <laughs> we actually remove the interdiction, that data layer, and let access happen straight to the disk, that's also available as well. All right, so I sourced a few other questions from great. some of your friends, and this one's coming from AB, and yep. he is asking, for large capacity containerized workloads, do you recommend provisioning a large volume or multiple smaller volumes? Any recommendations on the sizing best practices? Well, um, AB, uh, for those who don't know, is uh, one of the great uh, open source software entrepreneurs and engineers and is uh, CEO of MinIO. And, uh, and so MinIO uh, is generally speaking, which is an S3 compliant uh, object store, is generally speaking in the world in which um, you have, you know, like petabytes and petabytes of data, right? And what we've seen is that's a great uh, model, and I'm sure S, I'm sure MinIO is used with smaller deployments as well. Yeah. But uh, in our world, what we see, and I mentioned, I try to give credit to ThoughtWorks, but there's others who have talked about the rise of disaggregated data. And this is um, sort of the counter to the snowflake argument, by the way, 
is, yeah, 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 you can dump it all into something like that, and, it, and it's great, and, and uh, happy to have ties to Snowflake in the form of, you know, Frank, their CEO, being an investor. But what we see, to answer the question, AD's question, is the rise of tiny databases, like shitloads of tiny databases, and, uh, and small teams. And I mean, one of our, you know, Bloomberg, I think, has publicly said there's 3,500 engineers, you know, assembled into tiny teams, generally tiny teams, using this platform that we helped you know, support. And uh, there's a gazillion different databases for different workload, different uh, purposes. And uh, that's what we see. Uh, huge. So that, that, I don't know if we recommend it one way or the other, but that's a pattern that we see a lot of. If you then really need some sense of uh, a larger pool, we do see folks running MinIO on top of OpenEBS as, as AB knows <laughs> as well. So that's often a pattern we see is uh, it's, a, it's one easy way to run uh, MinIO is you have OpenEBS dealing with the disks or the because you can basically normalize your environment. Oh, I've got some AWS over here. I've got some uh, you know, EBS or direct attached over here. So, okay, that's fine. Let's have a common layer, which is where OpenEBS comes in. And so every time I deploy MinIO or some other workload, they're truly portable. OpenEBS has sort of normalized the differences amongst the underlying uh, storage. Well, speaking about portability, let's let's talk about that in just a second. I just want to continue down this road of, okay, you have thousands or tens of thousands of small databases. How does that get managed? Right. Yes, or does it? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's dogs and cats living together. I'm telling you, uh, it's uh, no. It um, this is another enabler today versus prior times. I I think anyway. And you can, I mean, there's some great. Uh, I I mentioned her uh, by name, the the ThoughtWorks engineer um, who's written more. Um, uh, about this disaggregated data pattern. So you can, if you happen to look at the CNCF CAS blog, the one that hit today, I think you will see a footnote to some of their writings, uh, ThoughtWorks writings. But, uh, um, but suffice it to say, Kafka is important. Right? Hmm. So uh, yeah, it makes no freaking sense if you don't have, um, it was part of the beauty of you know, Trust and Larry, the central Oracle database is that you, know, you knew where everything was. And so now you're saying these small teams all have their own databases. It's dogs and cats living together. How is this going to work? And the answer is often you have some pub sub type thing going on. And so some of them need to throw their data into it and share it, and some don't. And that's, that's kind of how it, how it plays out. Um, yeah. And then hopefully you have a solution like Kubera or some other solution that is smart enough to look at which of these containers actually, you know, is helping me manage my data, it is open yes. What is the storage class telling me about how I'm protecting this and managing it? And do I want to look at um, you know, the paved path that you've enabled the you've enabled the developers to do whatever they want, but what's the paved path that you're encouraging them to do and that you as a platform team are going to support? You know, with real SLOs so that, yeah, the, the dev team can do crazy shit if they want. If they want it supported, they're going to, you know, conform to these five or ten storage classes, whatever the YAML is. This is fast Postgres. This is, you know, super protected Postgres. They're going to embrace those. And then you have, like, a management console that gives you visibility in all of them. So that's practically how it's done. But the underlying enabler includes stuff like... Um, doesn't have to be Kafka, but a lot of Kafka. We're getting down to the wire. I want to talk a bit about portability because you mentioned it earlier. And it's not just about portability from cloud to cloud, right? I think you mm -hmm. have a, a different vision of portability. And can you explain that to us? We have some succinct way to put it. I'm trying to remember exactly what our golden words are, but I can't remember the. But it's basically what we see is multi cloud. Freaking misses the point, right? And there have been so much like Twitter, Twitter sphere arguments about multi-cloud. Is it real? Is it coming? When is it going to come? Or like every freaking environment we're in, there is a multi-cloud aspect, all of them. 
Why? Because I'm running Kubernetes locally, right? You're running it on the shared servers. There's, you know, someone else is running it in a slightly different environment. And eventually it gets to a pipeline where you have, you know, obviously you have a dev, uh, test, staging, prod. How can you make sure that dev is actually like prod? Well, prod, we use a $17 million, you know, array. Do you use that in dev? Really? Pretty unlikely, maybe. But how do you flatten those differences? You use Kubernetes, of course. That helps, especially on stateless. But for stateful container attached storage, there's a huge role there. So you literally can use your dev experience as the same, and you have this abstraction layer underneath. Now, when you get to prod, you're proud of that, you know, uh, $17 million array. Set aside the blast radius, you know, uh, that might happen, or it's reaching end of life. Or you can run container attached storage on top of it, and this is a big uh, thing that Portworks and you know Pure Storage are bringing to you, right? Is the two together, and that is a pattern we see as well, and that's perfectly fine. Container attached storage gives autonomy to teams, reduces the blast radius of that big uh, storage system, and then the storage system it's belt and suspenders. You can do that, um, but container attached storage also shifts left. So it's portability. You're literally, you can, the environment you spin up, in this environment is the same as that one, including the way you manage the data. So I feel like we need a buzzer for all these buzzwords. Yes. <laughs> when you say them, yeah. Yeah, for those who are playing buzzword bingo. <laughs> the last thing I want to talk about is your vision of where Kubernetes is going to go in the future, and then also how you feel about data on Kubernetes now. Mm -hmm. You mean your meetup or just more? The, no, the, <laughs> just doing it. If you want to do it, what is something that is. I think you're good at meetups. No, I don't. <laughs> um, so, data on Kubernetes is for sure now a pattern embraced by. Uh, those companies for whom software development is a competitive advantage, or at least something that they invest in. Um, is it fully mainstream? No. Again, going back to CNCF survey, I think it's something like, it's. don't quote me, but it's like 70% of folks say they're going to run data on Kubernetes or use one of these storage projects, I think is the way they asked it. And like 13% say they're fully in prod. So, so we're somewhere in between there. Um, we certainly see the, again, Bloomberg's of the world achieving massive outcomes. Um, and, and that's great. But Bloomberg is an unusual organization, right? Um, so our exercise is to make their patterns and the appropriate patterns consumable for a broader and broader reach of organizations. Uh, where it's headed is, you know, I won't fully tip our hand. Some of it we kind of wrote about, tried to write about in our secret plan to world domination like three years ago. <laughs> uh, you look back on that, it's strikingly similar to what we've been doing over the last three years. I will say that the rise of the ability to deal with latency over wide areas and the networking side and something some folks are calling data mesh um, you think about that. If you're an engineer managing data as a distributed systems problem, what happens when you know deterministically you can get a, a packet or let's say in our case, you know, an image backing a backup from point A on the globe to point B in the globe in a, in a known time frame, and it's a reasonable time frame. Things get really interesting and you don't have to just buy the cloud service to do that. Um, so there's going to be some real interesting stuff in terms of data fluidity, if you will, over the next uh, year, two years for sure. And we'll have kind of a, a hint at that even at KubeCon that we're talking about. Um, but no, the main focus for us is we can show you it's the fastest way to run data on Kubernetes. So if you think just in sheer performance, but also turning up systems, all of that, and productize the heck out of that, 
make it clear 24 by seven support, make it clear we have all of the management, we don't have all of it, but a lot of the management bits around it that you need and take you know what the Bloombergs are using to be tremendously successful companies into the mainstream organizations. And um, that's the short term, but in the medium term, you're gonna see the loosening of certain constraints allowing fundamentally different patterns, like a disaggregated metadata cloud, if you will, and uh, yeah. without having to just go all to uh, Snowflake. So last question is going to come from the chat. Yep. It's uh, Marant Marantis is bringing Marantis, a lot of yep. Marantis. That's it. I can't. Uh, so Marantis is bringing a lot of discussion about implementing Kubernetes with Docker Enterprise in bare metal. Open EBS user space implementation can get advantageous with this approach a less hypervisor workload yes and um i'm just writing a note to myself should ping uh see if they if Marantis wants to be involved in this announcement at kubecon but yes there you go amen absolutely bare metal we also have users for whom virtualization has been seen as a way to get more security but there's actually folks who are very comfortable with getting to incredible, you know, zero day zero support, uh, day zero exploits through builds, certified builds and SE Linux and so forth, lockdown. So we think that, that you can get your cake and eat it too. It's not quite there yet in the ecosystem, but with bare metal. So extreme performance and security. Um, we will see. There may still be like a Kubert or you know, something like that a slight virtualization layer in there. But yeah, that's a great question and love to talk to you. I should follow any time, um, you know, offline if you want. Um, we also have kind of a, we have a number of users migrating from existing container attached storage to the open, open EBS container attached storage. And we'd love to run by you how that's happening because we want to get the word out. Like here's the scripts people are using. So happy to chat with you about that as well. Nice. Evan, thank you so much for being here and sharing your vision of current events and future events with us. Really appreciate this. I also want to mention that you have been a big supporter of the doc since the inception. So we got to give credit where credit is due. Thank you for that. And we will be, uh, we will be in touch. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And let us know if there are any more questions. What's the best way to keep in touch with you, Evan? Well, you can find me on various Slacks, including the D Data on Kubernetes Slack. I'm there we usually, go. Um, I think I'm Evan Powell there, or you can find me ePowell101. Uh, I live near the 101 here in San Mateo. <laughs> so you can ping me that way on Twitter or Evan at myadata.io. And, you know, communities win. Uh, but you, but you got to invest in them, and sometimes that's asking questions. So thank you, folks, for asking questions. Sometimes it's writing code, whatever. But uh, really, really, really happy that you're doing this, Demetrios. It's uh, it's how people move forward. So thank you. Right on. I'm happy to be doing it. So thanks again, everybody. We will see you later. Have a great day or night wherever you are in this world.